All right. So I'll let me shut the door here. Sorry, I wasn't here on Monday, um, and that was last minute notice. Uh, hopefully, you were able to take advantage of the time and, and catch up on on uh, class or on other classes that maybe falling a little bit behind on. Um, before I continue, I wanted to ask about questions about the final project that, that you uh, may have. Um, I posted on Slack a, a rough draft and, and asked you to look through that and, and be, um, be able to ask any questions that you might have. So I wanted to uh, do that first here. I definitely encourage you, if you haven't been looking at it, working on it, you need to do that because it's a huge step up from, from the last assignment because you're putting all the pieces together. Um, you'll be, instead of using the unit tests that are provided, you'll actually be running the simulator. Um, I found last year that some students had implementations that passed the unit tests, but when they put the parts together, they didn't work. The, um, the way they expected them to because the unit tests didn't cover a specific edge case um, so they're not um, fully robust in, the, in that sense so don't depend upon just because the unit test tells you that your register file works or that your um, your other components work that, um, that it all fit together the nice thing is in your cases all you have to do is provide the CPU. You don't have to use your, your other uh, implementations if you don't want. Um, so it's can you put together the CPU and the components together to make a, a fully functional uh, unit. Um, so you, you definitely want to um, work on it. You want to make progress on it. Um, and and um, start being able to ask questions. I've intentionally put the due date for it whenever the uh, exam is scheduled for, for this class. You can think of it as being your your final exam in this class in that manner. We still will have one more last in-class exam the, the last day that we're here present. Um, but Mentally, you can kind of think of it that way as, as completing, summing up uh, the learning for this class with that project. Um, all right. Again, remember that if you want, as a class or as a group, a smaller group, you can be building a shared assembler to, to use for that assignment that is outside of the scope of the project. Um, technically, you don't need an assignment to complete the, uh, you don't need an assembler to complete the assignment. You'll just um, be doing a lot of hand generation of, of binaries that would probably just go a lot quicker if you do build an assembler. All right then, let's uh, continue where we left off then on Friday, we were talking about vector processors. Um, so <clears throat> we're in this quadrant right here, right, of uh, SIMDI, right, where we have one single instruction of multiple uh, pieces of data that that instruction is working on. And on Friday, we looked at an example architecture that has this set up, the vector architecture. So with the vector architecture, we said that each register wasn't a value, but a sequence of values. Um, and so we can, um, as a result, build a, a CPU, with deeply pipeline uh, ALUs, and the nice thing about that deep pipeline is 
is that our vector is going to feed into that pipeline and so we know it's not going to stall waiting on data dependencies or control dependencies. All the hazards that we talked about making pipelines difficult kind of uh, dissipate when it comes to our vector processor. So we, we might have two, three, four of these ALU units and we're passing those vectors to, but it's, it's fairly narrow so that we can have this deep pipeline. Today, we're going to look at alternative uh, the, where we do a wide but shallow way of, of implementing that. Okay? Uh, when we get to how do GPUs operate. Uh, but we're going to do a, like a transition uh, in between the vector processor and the GPU. And we're going to talk about um, the SIMD um, extensions to x86 processors. Uh, these, th there are similar extensions to ARM processors and so forth, uh, but I'm just going to focus on, on these because we'll get the general ideas down without having to focus on the nitty gritty, what is the exact instruction that's being provided, and, and so forth. So, <coughs> what happened here is that um, the XA6 instruction architect looked at types of programs that were executing and, and said, are there ways that we can support these types of programs going forward? And they they saw one big use of the processors were uh, for um, streaming multimedia. And I'll put this in parentheses because in reality when they were looking at this, the internet was still quite in its infancy, so they were thinking about from streaming, they were thinking about streaming it from your CD-ROM into your, rather than streaming it over the network. But, regardless of where the content is coming from, the reality is people needed to be able to process large amounts of audio and video quickly. And the nice thing about these sources are that you perform the same operation over and over and over again. When you're displaying an array or a, a matrix of pixels on the screen, how you compute the leftmost pixel versus the rightmost pixel is the same basic computation, it's just which data you're doing that computation on. Um, and, and so the, the architect said, let's provide instructions that will support these, these processes. The other thing that they, they looked at is if you're talking about, for example, video to start with, you tend to have um, RGB and maybe an alpha value. And each one of these is an 8-bit value. Maybe I should have done this with my red, green, and blue marker. That would have been Nicer. Uh, so this is a, a total of a 24-bit value, maybe a, or a 32-bit value. Uh, depending upon whether you, you use the alpha channel or not. So if you're thinking about a 64-bit processor, and you've got registers that are 64 bits, we're wasting at least half of the register on a particular pixel. And if you want to do something on just the red values of, of your pixels, or just the green or blue or the alpha, whatever, you're dealing on an 8-bit entity, and you're wasting even more of the processor, uh, the register space. So what the 
the SIMD instruction said is if we take a register, um, maybe a 64 bit register for now, um, we can break it up and we can load maybe four values into that register. Take advantage of the 64-bit value that that register has. And so now we've got um, element 1, uh, if I can spell, element 2, element 3, and element 4, right here. Uh, and we take some other register here, with those same elements, if we wanted to do something like smoothing, or edge detection, or pick your favorite video operation that you need to do, what you might want to do is add each of, of these elements independently. If we don't have the SIMD extensions to their processor, that's going to result in using four registers and doing four addition operations. Because we have to load each of these elements into separate registers and we have to do the arithmetic between each of those four registers. But since these are just 8-bit values or 16-bit values or whatever, if we can slightly modify our atom, and we can load all four of these elements into these two registers here, we can run this using two registers rather than the eight that we would need. And we can do it with one addition instruction rather than the four that we would need. Basically, what we're going to do um, is we're going to take our adder and we're going to break it up. So we haven't talked about the detailed implementation of adders right here. Uh, so I'm going to break into that for a little bit to show how this would not be too hard. And what I'm going to do is I'm not even going to talk about the detailed implementation of an adder. Um, I'm going to simulate. Let me do 8-bit arithmetic here. And I'm going to add negative 1. I'm going to add positive, negative 1 as our top operand and positive 1 as our bottom operand. So in 2's complement, how do we represent negative 1? All 1's. All 1's. All so that would be negative 1 right there, right? And positive 1? Where? Just on the far right. Yeah, because that's the least significant bit, right? You look like I was trying to trick you. Uh, <laughs> no, I, uh, I really want to make sure that people remember to say least significant but most significant bit, right? So let's add these, these two numbers. We, we expect the result to be zero, right? Negative 1 plus positive 1 should equal 0. So let's go ahead and, and do that. What is 1 plus 1? Two. 2. So we're going to write that in binary as 1, 0. So we have to carry this 1 right here. And now we have 1 plus 1 again. So we're going to get the same output here, right? And this repeats for all eight bits. And then we have this one that we carry out that we, that we ignore right here. Now imagine this expend, extended not just through these eight bits, but through all 64 bits right here. We need to be able to build an adder where a carry out in this least significant bit here can ripple through the entire computation and affect the most significant bit in the end. Right? 
That's how the, the computation might carry out. No pun intended. <coughs> so, <coughs> so our adder within any particular bit position is pretty much the same. We take our input value for our first operand, we take our input value for our second operand, and we look at the carry input value from the, the previous bit, bit. And we produce an output bit, and potentially the next bit's carried out. So if we were to draw that, right, we would have two input bits, say A, N, and B, N. We would have a, a carry in. We would have the sum bit at that location and our carry out. This is how one bit works. Right. In fact, I'm going to resubscript these carry outs. I'm going to make this carry sub n and carry sub n plus 1. Because now what we can do is we can connect this same box here, a n plus 1, b n plus 1, sub n plus 1. And we can go earlier the same way. A n minus 1, B n minus 1, carry n minus 1. And our adder, our simple adder, maybe not our most performant adder, but our simple adder is just going to string together a bunch of these boxes. What do we call these boxes? Ripple carry adder. That's what the connection of all of them is, is a ripple carry adder. What is the individual box called? What kind of adder? Is this a half adder? No. A full adder? It's a full adder. A half adder doesn't have a carry. Yeah. yeah. The full adder has the carry input. All right. So, logically speaking, we might implement our, our adder a little bit differently. But logically speaking, we're just going to connect a bunch of these full adders together to produce our 32, or 64, or 128-bit adder. So, if we've got something like this, where we just string together 16, 32, 64 of, of these together, doing something like this is super easy, because on this element boundary right here, all you do is you don't route this carry to the next full adder. This becomes the carry out for this particular element here. And you have a um, no carry in for that. <clears throat> so all you have to do is optionally disconnect this carry when you're doing this special type of addition here at these particular boundaries here. Right? So if you're doing 8-bit additions, at every 8 point, you just disconnect that carry coming through. If you're doing 16-bit additions, you just disconnect it at 16-bit boundaries and so forth. So it's really easy to do this kind of an operation on multiple elements at the same time because you've already got the adder that is able to do this. You just optionally disconnect this already connected line. And we can do that with something like a multifunction. So it's, it's really easy to build an adder that can do something like this. Does that make sense? And we can do that not just with addition, but with any operation that our ALU supports with this type of a connection right here. So they said, great. We'll just build 
<coughs> we'll just build an instruction that does this. We'll build one instruction that says the elements are 8-bit elements. We'll build another instruction that says these are 16-bit elements. A third instruction that says there's 32-bit elements. Okay? And I do mean a new instruction for every size of element that we break our register up into. Okay? This is a big difference, a significant difference, between the SIMD instructions that an x86 processor support and the vector instructions uh, that our vector processor supports. If you remember from Friday, we said that the size of the vector was not encoded into the instruction set. So if you made a bigger, better vector processor that had more elements in its vector, you didn't have to change the code that you compiled to execute on that bigger vector. Well, guess what? That is not true when it comes to the SIMD instructions for our x86 processors. Because we have deeply encoded into the instruction how big each one of these elements are. And when we expand our register size from 64 bits to 128 bits, we have to have a new instruction because our register now is different. And we could have 8 bit, 16 bit, 32 bit, and 64 bit sub elements of this 128 bit register. So we just doubled the number of instructions that we need to support now for our 128-bit register that is part of this extension. Um, and so you get this huge proliferation of new instructions whenever we try to make our processor more capable. And this is not theoretical. This has been expanded. These, these registers in the x86 architecture have expanded not just to 64-bit, not just 128-bit, uh, I believe the current state of the art are 256-bit registers, and it's already been specified, but not implemented, that a 512-bit register is on its way. Okay, so every time they did one of these expansions, they had to new, add new instructions to the instruction set to be able to handle the size of this register, the name of the register, and how many elements are packed into that register. All right. So this is, it is a SIMD inst instruction, right? Because we're doing one instruction, we're doing add across multiple elements here, but it's also limited because it has to fit into uh, the register that's already been provided by the processor. Um, and it's kind of limited in how effective it is for the processor to continue expanding the size of these registers because that actually changes the instruction set. That means that if you want to take advantage of this new instruction, this 512-bit register, when it comes out, you do have to recompile your code because you do need to generate the new instruction that assumes the 512-bit register size instead of the 256-bit register size or the 128-bit register. And worse, if you compile your code assuming the 512-bit register size and someone decides to run it on their old processor that only supports the 64-bit register, uh, tough luck. You, you have just, they have, you have just forced them to run an illegal instruction on their processor. So now, what do you do if you're producing consumer pro, um, software? And you want your product to be able to be run on as wide range of different CPUs as possible. You use the smaller register sizes because it's the only one you can depend upon, right? So even though 
there, it, that might be ancient, it might be from the 1990s or the early 2000s, it's the only thing you can safely depend upon. And so you've got these instructions available to you on some large percentage of the CPUs that are actually running your code, but you can't do them. Or, you have to dynamically choose at runtime which set of instructions you're going to actually execute. So you've got extra runtime overhead deciding, well, I'm going to use this instruction set or am I going to use this instruction set? All right. So it's great that these have been added to the x86 instruction set because they do provide benefits. Um, but it's hard to actually use them. Comes back to our CISC versus RISC mentality. These are very com complex, not logically, but they're complex for the compiler to choose. Oh, I should use this more complicated instruction. It's going to benefit me. Well, how do I know that as a compiler I can assume that that's going to be used by all systems that it's being run on? And so they aren't as deeply used as they could be because the compiler writer is afraid to generate those particular instructions. Right. Okay. Start then with understanding how GPUs are built. Okay. The first thing that you need to know, and I've mentioned it already once, is that because GPUs were developed in tandem with CPUs using different architects and different uh, purposes at the time, they used different terminology. And so the terminology that you will find for GPUs might be different than the terminology that you find for vector processors or for CPUs. Uh, and so it can be really confusing when you see one term in the GPU community, you see another term in the CPU community, and it turns out that they're basically the same thing, but they've decided to use different terminology. So I'm going to try to continue to use the unifying language that your, your authors put forth in your textbook in an effort to try to show when GPUs are similar to vector processors and when GPUs are different from vector processors. Um, however, that means that if you do like a Google search on the terms from your textbook, they may not show up in GPU literature because that's not the, the terms that the, the GPU de developers have, have come up with. I'm sorry, I don't have a good way around that. <coughs> so, GPU is an acronym for what? Graphics processing. Graphics processing unit. And the reason I want to point that out is not that we're going to be focusing on graphics, but that's the historical context under which graphics processing units were designed. They were designed to work in that kind of a domain. And what happened, why we're talking about GPUs in an in a architecture class at all, 
is that people started to realize, wow, those GPUs, if you just look at how much data they're processing and how much data they're getting through the system, the throughput that they're providing, that's really impressive. Can we try to hijack those processors for something other than graphics work? And initially, that was really hard because what you'd have to do is you'd have to kind of fool the GPU into thinking that it was working on graphics work rather than on the work that you were really doing. Um, but enough people started to do this that processor vendors like NVIDIA said, hey, maybe this is a new revenue source for us. If we utilize our architecture and sell it to the scientists who, who are caring about simulating protein folding, or these cryptocurrency miners who care about mining cryptocurrency, or the, um, in addition to these gamers who really want these high performance gaming rigs, right? Let's expand the, the realm of where we target our processor to. And when they began to do this, they said, well, we will probably have a better market if we somehow are able to not always try to shoehorn every problem into being a graphics problem, but somehow be able to address it in a more natural environment for the problem domain that is being tackled. They did not, however, fundamentally change the underlying architecture. What they tried to do is allow you to program it from a non-graphics oriented mindset. Uh, and once they did that, then they were right. It really blossomed and, and all these domains and more said, hey, let's use these GPUs for the high performance processing that, that we need. So let's look at what that underlying architecture is and, and how it works. Um, so, what we're going to do is we're going to try to dissect why NVIDIA actually calls this SIMT or SIMT processing rather than SIMD processing like we discussed in, in Boyd's algorithm here. So we have a single instruction, multiple threads are in this architecture. I don't think I'm going to get fully here today, but we will definitely finish it up in Friday's lecture. Um, this is coined by NVIDIA. Uh, so what we're going to talk about today is um, uh, threads and thread blocks on the GPU. Okay. So, what the architecture does is it takes our, our loop. And so, let's take a, a, an example. Um, and we'll do our, our DAX speed. You guys remember what DAX speed is? What did we say DAX speed is? It's double, and then it's AX plus Y. It's mm -hmm. double accuracy. Double precision accuracy, AX plus Y, right? So we're going to do C sub I equals A times x sub i plus y sub i. So that's our DAX speed loop right there. On our vector processor, we would do however many elements of this loop as we could because our vector 
registers held that many elements at a time. Right? So if our vector element had 32 elements, we would do 32 iterations of this loop all at the same time. Then the next 32 iterations, the next 32 iterations. We're going to do the same type of thing with our GPU. We're going to break up this loop into smaller units. Um, and we're going to break it up into um, groups of 32. Um, and we're going to call this our thread on, on the GPU. So that so we're going to just figure out how many groupings of 32 there are in this loop. The compiler knows the size of n. You actually have to tell the compiler what it is. And so it will break up this for loop into that many distinct threads. So if n was um, 512, then you would do 512 divided by 32, so 2 to the 9th, divided by 2 to the 5th, you would get 2 to the 4th, there's 16 threads. If it was 1024, you would get 32 threads, and so on and so forth. So we're going to break this loop up so that each thread operates on 32 elements of the loop at a time. <clears throat> all right? And all the groups um, together uh, are called thread blocks. So, so we have some number of threads that we break this loop up into, um, and we can then schedule those threads as a unit across our GPU. Now here is the beauty again. So similar to the vector processor, we're not going to put into our instruction set how many cores our GPU has. We're intentionally going to leave that outside of our instruction set, which is a great thing. Right? We don't want to put that in our instruction set because then it makes it impossible for us to build bigger and faster and better processors in the future. We just promise that we'll be able to execute a thread on a core at any given time. Maybe we'll have one core. Maybe we'll have 15 cores. Maybe we'll have 50 cores. I don't know. I don't want to tell you because I don't want you to hard code that into your program at any time. I want the flexibility as a computer architect to continue to make my system be better and more powerful. So what does a core that can execute one of these threads look like? This is the wide and shallow core that I was talking about at the beginning of the class. We're going to intentionally put probably sixteen ALUs in that core. Okay? So we have 16 ALUs. The thread is computing 32 elements. That means that at one clock cycle, all 16 of these ALUs are computing half of the elements inside of our thread. So it takes one clock cycle to do the first half of that thread, a second clock cycle to do the second half of that thread. 
So after two clock cycles, this core is able to execute one instruction inside of the loop. The addition or the multiplication inside of our DAX feed. <clears throat> so you can think of the core as taking two clock cycles to execute any particular thread. And that thread is going to execute the same instruction for both of those clock cycles. One for the first 16 elements, one for the second 16 elements. Is this making sense so far? Okay, so this is kind of weird because we're talking about a core as having 16 ALUs in it. Okay, it's really important that we think of it this way because if uh, you read some GPU literature, they will call each one of these ALUs a separate core. So they're talking about tens of thousands of cores on their GPU. They're talking about these individual ALUs. But when I'm talking about a core in class today and on Friday, I'm talking about a grouping of all these 16 ALUs together. Okay? So, There are some dedicated registers inside of this core. You oftentimes see this drawn like, like this, where it looks like these registers are committed to this core, and these registers are committed to this core, and so on and so forth. And that's what a lot of the written documentation looks like. But if you dig deep into actually how it's implemented, that is not the case. These registers can be divided up however they want for each of these ALUs. So they get allocated as needed by the processor. It usually makes the most sense to do it this way because if all the ALUs are doing the exact same instruction at the exact same time using the exact same register number, why wouldn't they all have uh, the same number of registers dedicated to them? But uh, technically speaking, they don't have to. Okay? And then down here, They have some shared memory between each of these ALUs. All right. So here's here's where the GPU shines. What we want to have is we want to have lots and lots. Well, that would help. We want many. We want many, many, many threads. More threads than we have cores on our processor. The reason why we want many, many, many threads on our processor is that what we can do is we can be running one thread execution through these ALUs while we're loading values into the memory for some other thread to execute. So when we talked about simultaneous multi-threading, the GPU is incredibly good at doing that. It can say, oh, I'm going to run thread number four because I've got thread number four's data in my memory. Oh, now that I've done with thread number four, I'm going to go ahead and run thread number 17, because now I have 17's 
memory. And so a big part of the processor is choosing which thread to run on a given core. And so there's core 0, core 1, core 2, core 3, and so on. And some part I'll thread block scheduler. This thread block scheduler is going to say, um, for all of our thread blocks, I'm going to choose to put thread 0 here. I'm going to choose to put thread 1 here, thread 2 here, 3 over here, 4 down here. And it's going to choose from all the cores where the different threads belong. Then on the given core, once this scheduler has said, you belong on this core, then it's this second scheduler that says, okay, given all the threads that I'm trying to run right now, this is the one that I'm actually going to have in the ALUs. All the other threads, they're loading data from memory, or they're storing data from this memory back to the, the large GPU memory. And that's what, what they're doing. And the whole point of the GPU is that we have so many threads available on this given core at a time that while, while most of them might be sending data to and from the memory units, there's at least one available to be running on these ALUs currently. So that we're never waiting to do execution. So even though memory is slow, even though it takes a long time to send data to memory or get data from memory, we hide that latency. We overlap that communication between this core and the memory with some computation from some other thread that is available to run. Okay, So each thread is going to have its program counter stored in this thread scheduler, as well as this thread scheduler keeps track of if that thread is runnable or not, based on whether it has loaded the next piece of data that it needs to compute into this memory segment. So what happens is we might say thread 1 gets all this subset of registers for that particular ALU. Thread 2 is going to get these other registers here. Thread 3 is going to get these registers right here. And so forth. So the compiler's job is to figure out how many registers are available here and figure out, okay, for a given thread, it can use 10 registers, or 15 registers, or 25 registers. It knows how many registers are needed for this particular function to execute. The less registers it needs, the more threads you can run on here at a given time. Because you can divvy up these threads, these registers, into more threads available. And so these registers become a bottleneck for how many threads we schedule on a particular core. And, um, and so that is a really um, important part of the processor. All right? So we'll pick up from here on Friday, and we'll talk about how we connect these cores together efficiently. All right? Have a good day. I'll see you guys then.